Good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. This Friday, February 16th, a little after one. Uh, we got a late start because we were celebrating one of our uh, student interns, Brennan, whose last day is today. And we are going to move right into uh, S203 and Act related to the appointment of the State Board of Education members. And so we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Bannon, Mr. Nichols, Ms. Siglowski. We're going to then hear from the Chancellor and on a somewhat similar issue, board building, board changing. And we're going to move into libraries, and then hopefully we'll be finished by about 3.15 or so today, maybe 3.30. It would be nice to have a little early. So with that, uh, Mr. Fan, S203, and just as a recap, and I'll let Senator Hewlett add if I miss anything, this is largely reworking the State Board of Education. You were here under the, um, who was your boss back? Joel Cook. Joel Cook and Joey Donovan and I and many, Sarah Buxton, we were all on this education committee when we first started to look at the State Board back in 2010 or so. And this, one of the things that happened during that time was we took the uh, appointment power, we allowed the state board, what were we doing? We said the state board used to oversee the commissioner hiring and firing. We said, we're gonna make this secretary level position, cabinet level position, and we are gonna let the state board be involved with the hiring process. We kept all of their duties and responsibility pretty much the same. So we're a little bit, <clears throat> I don't know if we're at a cross work road per se, but we know that the state board is really, really busy. I know you opposed the idea of giving them money last year, uh, additional sort of funds. You thought maybe we should look at all the boards and commissions, maybe not just close that, but um, we uh, we got to look at the state board and just look at the secretary's position a little bit. And this board, this bill kind of gets the conversation going. It may go in a couple of different directions, I think, having talked with other colleagues. This is the opportunity to say, but I stay for it. Maybe this is the time to just rethink things. So the well, floor is yours on all sorts of topics related to state board. Wow, it was quite the introduction. <laughs> uh, for the record, Jeff Van of Vermont and EA. Um, uh, and thank you for the, the cake. You're welcome. It was spectacular. And congratulations. I, I wish you all the best of luck. Would you like a piece of cake? Oh, sure. I recommend it, but it's <laughs> very good. So the bill uh, introduction you just gave, Senator, um, is a, is a is not contained in this bill. That's right. Three. Uh, Why don't you think broadly? Right. Right. No. No. Yeah. We, we came at it a yeah. bit, and, and that's not, actually uh, not a bad way to go. Uh, I don't have written comments on this particular bill. I'll just say, in short, we support the bill. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be clear on that. Um, but you do ask some fundamental questions about uh, what should be the, the purview of the state board. Yeah. They have a lot of work on their hands right now. Uh, and maybe, uh, you know, in the adage, uh, many hands make light work, that might be uh, facilitated by the, this board because this does increase the size of the board, mm -hmm. gives uh, mm -hmm. hopefully some uh, representation from those who are in the public school system or in the school system generally uh, a voice at the State Board of Education, which I think is important and perhaps lacking you know, of late. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a good bill. I like how the transition language works. Uh, I like uh, the appointment by the House and the Senate and, and also keeping the governor's hand in, in the appointments. Uh, and I do like the student uh, members of the board. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a healthy uh, dose. But, to that point, we've had student members on the board, great, but now this bill would have teachers that I'm you know, particularly concerned about, but uh, principals who serve uh, a different role, superintendents, uh, and that, that that makes a lot of sense, I think. Any danger? I mean, one of the things is time for all these folks it does take up, you know, the board takes up a lot of time. Yes. So I don't, I don't well, I don't know that personally. I, I've heard heard that it does. Have you, know, you ever looked at their schedule? I've not. You've never watched a meeting. Yes, I have. Okay, all right. I mean, it take. I mean, they have yeah. a pretty busy. I, I'm not right. arguing the point. Yeah. I just yeah. don't know yeah. personally. Yeah. I, I'm not. I've not been on the state board of education ever. So I don't. Uh, 
for well, you're not on this committee either, you know? Well, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Uh, so I don't know specifically what um, the workload is, but I have heard that it's, yeah. it's not insignificant. And again, many hands make light work. Yeah. So might this be uh, a way to, to address that too? Yeah. You have more subcommittees perhaps that could, you know, specific issues that take a little longer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so to that same point, I, you know, one of my questions um, regarding time on this committee or this board, I should say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, I'd, I'd like to see people from public schools on the board, uh, but, you know, considering the time constraints that teachers have, uh, that special education providers have, and and, you know, there's also a requirement that a parent uh, be on the board as well. And for that particular point, I think there should be some more uh, just refining the definition of it, uh, you know, who exactly. But, you know, for the teachers and the special education providers, is there, or I guess, can you provide a bit more information as to whether or not you think it might be feasible to make it a requirement that a teacher is on the board? Uh, I'd love to see it, but I worry that you know if you make the change, and I do support the change. And a teach there's you know, and there's no teacher who comes forward and says, "Yeah, I have so much time, and I'd love to be on this board." Uh, you know, what what would happen if we can't find a teacher to fill that? And so, do you have any more thoughts on? That? Sure. Yeah. Would you mind if I made a clarifying comment? No, not at all. Um, if you look at the language of the bill, it does say um, of which expertise or experience as. So there's so nothing. Oh yes. well, yeah, there's nothing here that says that the, these folks have to be currently employed in their position. It just says expertise or experience. So I, I just wanted to point that out. That's pretty broad. It doesn't. It, there's no requirement that they be working. So they retired. Yeah, they could be retired. Right. Yeah. So to answer your question, I think it's it's valid. Uh, my organization about thirteen thousand members. Uh, we have people who are interested in curriculum matters, political matters. We got a cross section of folks who have varying interests, and there are some who would be interested in this of, of the thirteen thousand or so members. For just for example. We're not named in here, so I'm not suggesting that that be the case. But uh, and I think that's the same. The same could be said for all of the boards in Vermont. We are very much in Vermont reliant upon volunteer board members for a, a, a host of things in this state, and that's good and it's challenging at the same time. Um, so I think uh, your argument is not invalid. I think we've just as a state we've come to a place where we do rely uh, on volunteer board members for a host of things. Um, and I think what you're suggesting perhaps is, do we want to professionalize the board? And I, I think the answer is no. Um, I don't, that's not, I'm super, trying to read into your question, you know, would that help? And I don't know that it would. I think people are willing to serve because they're willing to serve and they find time uh, to do that. And, and some people may probably go for a walk weekly than serving as boards and some other people may not serve on other boards. But there's a group of people in the state of Vermont, I'm sure, who would be willing to step forward and who are a teacher, a special educator, or principal, superintendent of sorts, and, and um, would be willing to serve. Great. Thank you. Can you identify a problem right now with the makeup of the state board? Uh, I think what we, um, my members, you know, are concerned about their focus being in places that don't necessarily directly affect them. Doesn't affect your members. Correct. Yeah. And their students in the classroom. So, you know, if you see somebody who's labeled as a state board of education doing yeah. things that don't influence or have an impact on your day to day life, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it's obviously not always the case. But I think they're, they're, they would, they might raise the question. Uh, I want to make sure that the, the State Board of Education does have uh, at least some influence on my life in a positive way in my classroom for my students. And I, I don't know that they would say that to be the case today. So I don't know if it's a problem, but it's a, right. it's a it, 
it is something that uh, so they don't know yeah. what the significance of the state board of education is today to their lives. Right. So, for example, is there something they're working on that is not impacting their lives? So I'm trying to prove a negative. It's a tricky. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to. I don't follow state board that closely, so I don't know exactly what their last meeting, for example. But yeah, yeah that's not coming yeah. back to. I yeah. don't recall what was agenda, but I think there's something important I'll watch or okay, just right now. Because um, if they're not working on things that are impacting your constituents, you will. What are they? That's what I'm trying to understand. Well, what so for example, right? Yeah, I'll yeah. Just say, so I think so much of it's like rulemaking and all that. Right, education like quality standards. Yeah, yeah. Right, the Act yeah. One. Yeah. Uh, that's a process that they've been working on for some time, uh, and given the rulemaking process and the top length yeah. of time that takes, that will affect uh, my members in the future. Yeah. I assume I'm making some assumptions here that that will go through the rulemaking process, uh, and there will be the way I understand it is. The way it's crafted at this point, we go effective July 1, 2024, for effective 2025. Yeah. School. So there's a lead in time. So will educators, principals, superintendents, teachers, special educators, all folks yeah. be affected by that? Yes. So that's something the state board is doing right now that they will see the impact sure. going forward. But uh, as to their day-to-day -day challenge, maybe it's misguided, but they, they may not see... Uh, the impact of a state board of education today. And I think the notion would be if you had a principal on there, for example, she might be able to say, hey, we've got this problem in my school. I've talked to some of my peers around the state. Yeah. Uh, how do we address that? Is there a way the state board of education could weigh in on this particular subject? I don't know, but right now that voice is lacking, yeah, I would say. But I would be interested in asking the state board person, how do they get some of this information out? In other words, how do they spend any time messaging to principals, superintendents, teachers, or is it more sort of, not close box, but you know, I mean, there might not be. I see it more out of the AOE. Uh-huh, that they're right, making, they're making field memo, for example. Yeah. We, okay. we redistribute that to our members okay. electronically. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the click rate is for open rate. Sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I can't speak for that, but Great. Uh, I don't know that the State Board of Education does something similar. I know this, Hey, we occasionally does mention what the State Board of Education is doing, you know? so that might be where people have notice of what the State Board is doing that might have an effect on their lives. Okay. Great. So, any other questions for Mr. Dan? Okay. Anything else, Jeff? No, I think that's it. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll wish you luck with it. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nichols, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. For the record, Jay Nichols, executive director of the Supervisor and Stevie. Not yet. Not yet. Not For the Vermont Principals Association, executive director. So, uh, a couple of things uh, as I start my testimony in S203. One, the question uh, I read the, the law the same, or the bill the same as Senator Gulick was saying. So, I would see it as I don't have any members that are going to have time in the state board, but I've got a lot of retired members who are still very invested in trying to make sure that our schools are high performing. So I think it's going to be retired superintendents, probably retired uh, teachers, retired principals that would fill those roles. And I actually like that idea because they're not going to be worried about just what's happening in their school that day. Yeah. They'll probably be in a better position to see the big picture and they'll have years of experience actually with you. So I, I really like the, how the, uh, composition of the board is being discussed. In my formal testimony, you can read it, but I do want to thank Senator Gulick, uh, Hashim, Hershlick, and Baruch for, for this bill. I think it's really good. I like the composition. I like the idea of the uh, Senate picking three folks that uh, you know you folks would recommend six to the committee on committees, and then over on the other side, three people from House Ed would be, or six would be recommended to the speaker. I think that's a good approach. I like the idea that Everybody has a little skin in the game in developing the, the state board. You've got the, the governor, you've got the Senate, you've got the House. I think it's very appropriate. Uh, and in my formal testimony, and I'll just speak this a little bit because you kind of brought up the opening statements, uh, Senator Kiffin. I think that personally, the State Board of Education and the Secretary of Education model we have right now has been a failed experiment. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and of course, full disclosure, uh, some of you know, I was one of the people that testified against this back when we came to the meeting. And as superintendents, we tried to have a statement on this and we could not come to agreement. And it wasn't for lack of trying. Yeah, you tested. What do you mean you tested? I testified for what? keeping it a state board with a commissioner and a department right. as opposed to an uh, agency. And but that back then, that was LePage or Page was representing the TPA. And, no, I was on, I was a trustee. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So we were asked to make it. EPA wasn't even involved. Right. The trustees, we all met on it. And I came see. up with uh, the president at the time, was the person you guys may have heard of. It was Dan French, and uh, the treasurer was me, and uh, there were other members, and Jeannie Collins and myself were adamant about how we should keep it the way that it was. Right. Dan and a few other people wanted to go to uh, secretary positions. And the rationale on both sides was fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, the argument that Dan and company made was to make the governor, and it wasn't about the particular governor. It wasn't, it wasn't Governor Shumlin. Scott when this happened. It was Governor Shumlin. It was, right. it was about the idea that they felt having it tied to the governor would make the governor have to be more responsible in education. Right. There were those of us that thought it would make it too politicized, and I still feel that way. And quite frankly, the two-year governor term has always scared me. I feel like the governor is governor for one year and then potentially running for yeah. re-election the next year. Now, truthfully, Vermont always re-elects our incumbent, but I just think it's bad public policy. So I think the state board right now is in a position where the AOE doesn't work for them. The secretary of the AOE doesn't work for them. They often can't even get help from the agency of education because the agency of education is a arm of the administration. I think it's a much more stronger model when you have a commissioner with a state board that is funded, supported, independent of government entity. With three government entities, really two, the executive branch and the legislature, but Senate and House helping decide what the composition of that board would be. So as you're talking about this, I think that's something that should be really considered about going back to a model where it would be commissioner driven and wouldn't be as politicized and we wouldn't be having some of the things that are going on right now. We're, we're almost a year without a secretary. And we can say we have an interim and that's not an often interim, very bright person. I like Heather a lot. We don't, we really feel rather than this how we feel. It is interesting. I, I remember one of the biggest arguments was we can elect someone to fill a pothole but we can't elect a well, governor who can run to fill a puddle. We can't elect a governor on an education issue. And that's one of the things I think that, that was an argument. we were on the floor. We yeah. were saying, yeah, you got to have a governor out there that can at least advance, talk about it if he or she wants to get elected for education yeah. kinds of issues. And I, and I get the argument. I've seen the study going, some dissertation in yeah. the future, yeah. sort of pre and post, where we're I can remember at sitting and, on Bill no Doyle's knee as a young person talking about this. And, uh, <laughs> just the argument, you know, that you and Alice make was if it was a six year governor term. Yeah, interesting. But the fact that it's two years and it's turning all the time, it just, it just sets up public education to be so likely to be politicized. And that's, again, not a knock on any individual governor. It's just on the system. I would rather see it be much more independent, mm -hmm. and much more focused on what they really believe that state board feels is best for kids with a commissioner answering directly to the state board. That's my question. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Cool. No, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, Bill does have my name on it too. And, but it's, I said that. Uh, I yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, um, I, mean, I, I agree with all these points that have been raised. And, you know, it's, I mean, everything we do in this building is politicized. Yeah, to some Education extent. is politicized, sure. sure. Yeah. Always has been, always will be. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I think, you know, with, with the board and the role that they should be playing, it's something that I think should take input from, you know, both branches of government and, you know, provide for a more balanced approach as to who is on the board and what parts of society they're representing. So, great. Anybody else? I do agree with the comment about the term of the driver. That's a whole different right. conversation. It's kind of like being a senator on the education committee. <laughs> it's all the time to figure out what's going on and right. see what you're doing. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. And I thought, did we not look at the term of governor? Did we not? We used that? to do it all the time in the the, what, the survey at Talladega, that's yeah, the I, survey. Yeah. But isn't it a constitutional amendment issue? 
Right, yeah. and I yeah. just have this recollection. Uh, I remember talking about it. I remember anything happening. Maybe, yeah. Oh, this is your left. Would you please? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. we might be the only state left this two years. Yeah. Might be the one other, but it, it, we're close to it. And yeah. then, then think about that in terms of right now. organizational leadership. Yeah. And the same thing holds true for the commissioner. You want somebody yeah. that's focused on education, yeah. working on the state board, not working at the realm of an individual governor, right. that could change just like that. But keep in mind, Go back and look at the tenures of our secretaries and commissioners. Just because you have a state board report doesn't mean they can't get rid of somebody after two years or one. It's true. All those kinds of things. It's true. Um, it's true. Yeah. So it is. It's interesting. It's complicated. Yeah. We should have said. Yeah. And, yeah. and I do think, and I think you'll agree with this too, the Senate, the upper chamber of the legislature, should have a six-year term. Uh, we've been told by the Speaker of the House yes, that I mean, there's no upper chamber, <laughs> that there's two equal chambers. Just okay, the, yeah. for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Ms. Siglowski. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Lisa Siglowski, Executive Director for the Vermont School Boards Association. I submitted written testimony to you, and I um, won't go through that word by word. But um, the essence of it is that we feel that S203 is the more inclusive and equitable approach to the appointment process. It does maintain executive influence in the process, but also provides um, the opportunity for the Senate Committee on Committees and the Speaker of the House um, with the responsibility to appoint a certain number of members. Um, we think it is um, in the best interest of uh, state of Vermont education to have a diverse and um, inclusive representation um, the state board of education and um, wanted to also point out that we recognize that this um, state board and the agency play a vital role in our education system and we have a resolution to that effect I'm not going to again read it to you but it is in my written testimony and um, Part of that resolution says that uh, in order to accomplish these goals, the agency of education must be properly staffed and resourced. VSBA desires to be a strong partner with the State Board of Education in overseeing Vermont's education system. VSBA believes that the State Board should include an active school board member, an administrator, and a teacher. Um, the governor should consult with the VSBA in the selection of a school board member. So um, as such, we support the proposed new requirement that the State Board of Education members include at least one member with um, expertise or experience as a principal, superintendent, teacher, school board member, educator, preparation program provider, special education provider, and parent. So those are all the um, entities that are listed in the bill, and we agree with that. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to note that this fall, our members adopted a resolution that came from um, a school board in Addison County, um, charging the BSBA staff with convening a task force to assess the needs of our school districts, examine whether the state board and agency of education are meeting those needs, and develop recommendations um, for actions um, by the governor and the legislature. So we have convened that task force. It includes one school board member from each of our 11 regions, and um, we expect that they're gonna wrap up their work next fall with the goal of completing a report by November. And um, so I may have some additional recommendations um, after that report. So we can and, say again what that task force is doing? They're taking a look at the work of the Agency of Education and okay. the State Board and any concerns about um, how those entities are serving the field, including school boards. So, one of the things we've talked about in this committee, and in a way it overlaps with it, is whether or not, you know, how, the, how this agency has changed over the years, where there might need to be new people, additional people, both focusing on, of course, literacy. We know that there's a CTE position will likely pass as well, but also enforcement. Will this get to any of that, or? I think that it may. The task okay. force has held one meeting, um, okay. and they're going to be meeting once a month, we have a um, consultant that's working with them, plus one of our staff members. So okay. um, I think it will be a pretty comprehensive report. We're hoping it will be. And if you're willing to share with that group that question that we have been talking about 
for last year and this year, you know, is does the agency are all the positions that we need there? Yeah. That would be great if they were able to to weigh in on it any and all of that. I realize it's a big ask, but um, it would certainly, if we don't get an opportunity or the financial uh, support to do an audit, having that as the beginning of a process that might go forward would be, would be great. Yes, happy, I'd happy, be happy to pass that on. And just also wanted to mention that they're approaching this from a growth mindset, not from the role of being um, overly critical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so uh, Senator. Uh, Thank you. Um, are are you suggesting um, a change in the bill? Because it seems as though on the on your second page, the second paragraph, you, you want an active board member. <clears throat> well, that is that is the resolution. That resolution is quite old. Oh, you, this is so yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're so you're okay with yes, we're okay, okay with the length of the bill. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Thank you for your <clears throat> for your testimony. Um, uh, it's just a general comment for the committee. Um, you know, this this is something I, I really support this bill, and I hope it's something we move, you know, that we're able to move forward. And you know, in, in looking at it, you know, I, I do want to stay true to what my uh, beliefs are, which is that you know there needs to be a balance on it, and that. We do have, you know, for better or worse, depending on what your views are, uh, you know, we do have a, we have a unique ecosystem between public and private schools. Uh, and, you know, as I'm reading the makeup, I, I don't see, I, I do see, in my opinion, a pretty, you know, a substantial number of folks who would have originated from the public sector or public school sector. And I think that's great. But I, I don't, I am not seeing that there is at least one spot that does represent approved independent schools. Uh, and I do think that there should be at least one uh, because again, regardless of what your thoughts are on approved independent schools, there is a uh, relationship between our public schools and approved independent schools. And you know, to stay true to that balance that represents the uh, diversity in this ecosystem, I think there should be one position from there. No, you're not. Listen, we're getting to No, you're not. Yeah, you can well, huh. Senator Taylor, please. Well, so I don't, there's nothing explicit here about these being public school people. So I don't know where you're seeing that. So it's this expertise as a principal, the superintendent, a teacher, a school board member, educator prep program. There's no, uh, it's not explicit that it's a public school or an independent private school or, or independent, what, what's it called? Sorry, independent. Approved. Independent. Approved, thank you. So I don't know. I mean, they could be from anywhere. Yeah, and it, they Would you absolutely agree? could be. Um, in Under the current system, if you have a governor, I'm not referring to our current one, but any governor who could say, we're going to load this up with principal who was from an approved independent school, a teacher from an approved independent school, and a special education provider from an approved independent school. So I guess to that point, maybe there needs to be more, it needs to be more explicit in general as to who is representing public schools and who is representing approved independent schools. I'm just yeah throwing it out there. We do have this hybrid system. There should be at least one person. And again, whether you know, regardless of your thoughts, not you specifically, but anyone's thoughts on approved independent schools, they do exist. Mm -hmm. And there are students who attend them. And this board does create rules that affect those schools as well as the public schools. So. So yeah, I think that we should figure out how to sure, make yeah. sure there is, you know, some equity for who's being represented on the board. So you want all these positions to be more explicit? I, I think if we're going to do markup, uh, which well, we definitely should do markup and you know look more, yeah, yeah look look more explicitly as to what type of balance we want to have on this. Yeah, so.
uh, to your point. So it's not exclusionary language, but it's not inclusionary language. And it would be helpful given our hybrid system. I'm sure that at least one seat represent this unique uh, hybrid system that we represent. So that, that's what's my idea. And it's interesting, right now, correct me if I'm wrong, there are on the board, there are two school, current school board members and two former principals that are here. On the I current board. I don't believe there are any current school board members on the state board right now. I may have been misreading my list. But we can come back. Oh, wait, um, excuse me, there is one. There is one, yes. Okay. Uh, Please. Just out of curiosity, uh, as we gain testimony on this, any intention of bringing the chairman of this board in? To, that was yeah, to I mean, she's been in a lot, but we can certainly have her. It is interesting. She, they didn't seem, when I reached out to them about this, they felt as though they, they almost wanted to stay a little bit out of it, but we can look back to them. So it would be interesting to learn, you know, kind of uh, from a mechanism state. Yeah. Does it work? Does it not yeah. work? You know, what yeah. will they change if they yeah. change? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, do we want to have uh, somebody from the therapeutic school on there? How about uh, deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind? You know, are you going to get into that kind of detail? I think I agree that. We have a special education provider. Okay. There, yeah. It's on there. Yeah. So, it's on there as an option. Right, but not as a report. Right. Okay. Just thought. Yeah. Well, we can look like Senator Sheep said we can work on some of the details during markup, but I think, I think it's required the way I'm reading it. Yeah. You, you have to have a special education service. Oh, for the other subcategory we're talking about. Okay. I get it. I get it. Um, I think the current chair is school board member also. Correct. Yes. So You're right. I'm sorry. There are two. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, anything else on this? Helpful. Please. Possibly, just again, find balance yeah, in yeah. this conversation. Invite one of the governor's staff to come in and talk about their perspective on shifting from a governor's yeah. appointed system to, a, 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 again, a hybrid. Might learn some. Lessons there or floor yeah. may not. Yes. Great. Good. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a million, Sue. And thanks for reaching out to that group that's doing that work. I will do that. Terrific. Okay, we're just waiting for the chancellor to arrive. So um, we'll take five minutes, Morgan. Welcome back to Senate Education. We are shifting gears now. We have the Chancellor of the State Colleges. Uh, with us, Chancellor Mauck, uh, and we're so happy that you were willing to come back in. When you first arrived, you were you know, maybe two weeks, now you've been here about six weeks. We'd love to hear how things are going just a little oh, bit, uh, and, uh, and then we can also transition into the bill itself and discussion around thoughts on faculty and staff being on the university's board. And this uh, Shared governance conversation is one that I think has been happening in the state for a long time, probably at your the institutions you've worked at in the past. And so we would welcome a conversation around that as well. So sure. with that, anything you'd like to share around your tenure thus far? That's my we, now six week tenure. Six week tenure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have had just a wonderful six weeks getting to know more about the system of uh, been able to now get around to all but one of the campuses for the newly formed Vermont State University. Uh, very, It's been very exciting. I've gotten to meet a number of our students uh, in all kinds of fields, uh, watching them as they are participating athletically, um, academically. Just uh, earlier this week, I was able to see a student who's been working on some research on ticks in the state, which is so oh. important. I was just with the Secretary of Agriculture um, at, at one of the buildings uh, connected outside Randolph, and um, they are also doing tick research. So it's very important for our students to see, uh, you know, everyday applications of uh, 
research and what they might be able to do in the future. We were talking to a uh, DMV and uh, doctor of veterinary medicine, and she asked the question, how is it that we get more students in the state to be interested in working with uh, large animals as opposed to small animals? And so certainly as we have moved um, to fewer and fewer folks um, having a lot of experience with farms, um, having opportunities for our students to see what it would be like to work with large animals is very important. So a lot of these experiential opportunities are just very, very important to them. So it's been very good. Next month, I'm going to get to uh, CCV's campuses with Joyce Treaty. So I'm very, very excited about all that. So great. So it's been good. It, yeah. The system has been very good. And, yeah. Learning all the nuts and bolts as well. We want you to be successful. We, you know, so if there's anything we can do to be helpful in any way, um, I know you know where we are. And yes. We yes. elected, as you know, re-elected Lynn Dickinson to the board mm -hmm. yesterday and elected a gentleman who's Mark, name. Mark Mahali. Mark Mahali. Hopefully will be a good addition. And if not, we'll go right on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll be fantastic. <laughs> uh, I've been able to already work with him just a little bit and, right. uh, in these couple of weeks, and I think he'll be very good. Uh, certainly having folks that are dedicated to the, the system and, you know, the, the students that we serve, I think is very important. He clearly has demonstrated that so far. Right. Thank you. Any questions for the Chancellor before we move into um, our conversation about the folks on the University Board of Trustees? Yes, yeah, so sir. Your predecessor asked about um, your positions within the chancellor's office that are outside the state. Or actually, you got to ask for some kind of a data on how many uh, positions have been created. Had, had the uh, positions expanded? Because I understand that there were some positions in Nebraska or Missouri, some other state. Um, and I asked for some uh, funding. Uh, you know, kind of spreadsheet. I won't put you on the spot for that right now, but uh, I also, we were asking about the strategic plan. I know you've talked about creating one of those. So have you had any progress on that? Uh, on the data, uh, I'm sure, yeah, that I'm sure we, we can get to you, okay. uh, you know, okay. here in the next little bit. I'll make sure you get that. Um, and Senator Williams, just to confirm, you're looking for the chancellor's office, financial makeup, budget, right. And you had heard, excuse me, um, I should have taken your advice and not eat it. Uh, <laughs> in front of the chancellor. Uh, you had heard that there might be some out of state positions that are being filled for people living out of state but working for the state colleges. Yes, and stuff. I will find out about that. Okay. I, I think the reason I'm asking is because of the funding. Obviously, we're, we're looking for money to keep things going. Uh, I've talked to a group of people who are here at uh, Castleton uh -huh. University, and it's like, um, you know, trying to convince them that they have to they have to help. It's, well, I look at it like a business. You know, they're the product of their business is students coming in the door and then going out the door, too. So, you know, what could they do to actually help, help that process? And I know um, our interim president met with them, I believe, recently. And mm -hmm. I would also like to be able to get to meet with them and talk with them and hear, yep. you know, some of their thoughts. Uh, I have been able to already get around and talk to some external groups. And, uh, you know, I just found that the more information I have, the better decisions I can make. And so uh, I would look forward to that as well. I've heard good things about your, your meetings with people. Oh, good. I'm yeah. glad to hear. Yeah. Well, there should be more. There will be more. And I, I also don't believe in just one off. So I would hope to meet with all these folks cool. again uh, when, you know, as soon as we're able to. But you should know if you don't watch this committee every evening that the president of UVM was also very complimentary of you. Yep. Well, he was in last week and was forward to working with you. I did. Uh, here's that. I, I was very impressed with it as well. I am hopeful yep. that the two of us could work together just for all of Vermont because it, he, he it's, it's just very, very good ideas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he said that he, he was looking forward to working with you. Yeah. Probably said he could share some of his money with you too. Oh, did he? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think both institutions play an important role in the future. I'm so excited to hear about that. Thank you. Anything else? 
So this conversation, ongoing conversation about shared governance and governance and having a voice from faculty and staff on the floor. And wondering if you might say a few words about that. Sure. And let me actually um I, I had prepared sort of just to talk about our, our board and, and sort of give you a, a backdrop for uh, whatever works for you. What we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think it'll help sort of set an understanding for the conversation. Um so First, I, I know uh, Sharon Scott spoke a little bit about this to the board, but to your um, So the board's role is on system governance and strategic oversight. Um, they are responsible for developing the mission, the vision, and policies of the institution to ensure financial sustainability and accountability and appoint, evaluate, and if necessary, remove the chancellor of the system. Um, the chancellor's relationship with the board, um, I report directly to the board of trustees. Um, it is a relationship of mutual accountability. Uh, and I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the systems. Uh, however, major decisions do need board input. Uh, the board is focused on ensuring high quality rural education for our students. Uh, transformation success is a result of the board's action. So this transformation success that we have been experiencing over the last three years really has been through the action and commitment of our board. Uh, they've made some really, really difficult decisions to preserve the system. Um, and frankly, this has been a time of uncertainty for our students, faculty, staff, and communities. I was not here when those decisions were made, but I do know that we would not be succeeding right now if it were not for this board. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about transparency because this is one thing that I have heard since I've got here. Um, in recent years, we have certainly made a concerted effort to improve the transparency of and access to the work of the board. Um, a couple of recent activities, certainly implementing virtual live stream meetings, which obviously were first a, a result of COVID, but we have continued those. So anyone can at any point either watch the board live or um, on um, YouTube afterwards, and we have moved public comment to the uh, beginning of the board. Um, and I just want to say that as a new chancellor, I really am committed to an open door policy with faculty, with staff, with students, and our community members. Uh, when ideas came to us from our communities, uh, when they do, we want to hear them. If there are changes we can make to fulfill our mission more effectively, we want to make them. And if there are blind spots, we want to address them. Uh, one of the things that I, I know there have been concerns about this lack of transparency in the board and, and our office's decision. Uh, I take those concerns very seriously. I am looking at how we have engaged with our students, faculty, our staff, and our communities in the past and see how and where I can improve upon it. We recently added two faculty members and two staff liaisons to what we call the Education Personnel and Student Life Committee, we call it EPSL, to the board. Um, that model has been very successful. So as I've been here, I you see then more interaction with faculty and staff. Um, regardless of what happens with the bill we're talking about, we are looking into expanding that practice to the rest of our committees. Um, the committees, frankly, are where the bulk of the work gets done. So when you see a board meeting, at that point, the work has occurred and the board is just accepting recommendations from these various committees. Um, but I do believe that if we're able to add more faculty and staff to these other committees, that will just deepen uh, further the input that faculty and staff have on the board. Uh, just a couple of things if you decide to pursue S-238. Um, it does propose adjusting the composition of the Board of Trustees and would cut the number of legislative trustees in half from four to two. Um, frankly, our legislative trustees make up a critical component of the board's makeup, so we don't support uh, remove, uh, reducing the number of legislative trustees. Frankly, the Vermont State Colleges was created in 1961 by the legislature, and so we do need robust um, input from the legislative body if we are to be successful. Um, and it has been my experience and my understanding that our legislative trustees have served the system well. Uh, we believe that their contributions are essential to the health of the system moving forward. Um, so I, you know, I, I certainly do want to tell you that I appreciate you taking some time 
to talk to me today, and I'm grateful for this shared vision. Uh, you know, and, and I'll just add, as a person who has been in higher ed for now nearly a quarter of a century, uh, I am very supportive of shared governance. And the shared governance model in higher education does involve the board through what is typically the president or chancellor in the system, um, and in particular, the faculty. That has been the model that has occurred. I am a great proponent of it. It's one of the reasons when you ask why Am I meeting with these folks and that? I'm, I'm meeting with them because that has, it has been my experience over these past 25 years that one needs to get engagement from those various groups um, so that we can ensure that we are doing what makes the most sense. Uh, the one thing I've often said, someone said to me, well, when you hire an English faculty member, you know, that would not be my expertise. So one of the things in the shared governance model is that we have to respect and rely upon the expertise, most particularly of our faculty. So when you talk about shared governance, mm -hmm. usually it's the faculty role um, of, of that uh, in so that what their expertise is, you rely on and you respect. And so that has been something that I've done throughout my career. But I will take questions now. <laughs> Please, Senator Weeks. Holy, um, so you, you mentioned that uh, the inclusion of um, uh, faculty or staff and students on the committees is something which uh, you're supporting. I, uh, yes. Okay, my assumption is though they're, they're non-voting members. They're, they're there to represent views and what have you, express insights, but not, obviously they're not voting because they're not on the, they're not on the, the board. Right, just as I'm an ex officio member. Okay. So, Okay, so <clears throat> to that point, though, I may have missed it in your testimony, but do you support in some it, it, uh, the inclusion of staff, faculty, students on the board as a principal? Well, however, it turns out in the end, but um, the concept. Right. So certainly, we already have a student trustee on the board. Like that has been longstanding. Uh, you know, I would say that that really is the purview of the legislator and legislature and committee. The thing I probably suggest is that we look at other systems and or other boards just to ensure. You know what? You know, do do research, do our due diligence. What what does that mean? You know, what would it mean for? Uh, others, but that's that was the suggestion. Thank you. So right now, their students are or are not, <clears throat> our faculty and staff and students are or are not on the committees. Uh, the only, uh, they're, they're actually, I don't believe our students on the committees. The only committee that we do have faculty and staff representatives on are the, what we call the FSOL committee, Bas basically the education that it's a, yeah learning of some of the academic programs and student life programs of the board. Um, the other committees that I would uh, recommend this to and strongly support would be our uh, finance and facilities committee, our audit committee, uh, and I cannot think of the third one. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fourth committee that I would. These are committees. This is something you're interested in taking. This, 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 it is, this, yes. So this that is not a legislator. That's just something yes. you would like to build out yes. if it was something. Thank you. Senator Duell. <clears throat> I just want to saw your hand. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Did anybody else see Senator Duell's hand up? Or was it just me? Something in the cake. It's not going to be a big one. I'm not going to. Great. Senator Sheen, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you yeah. all. Have a great weekend. Yeah. The sun is out. So. Enjoy. Thank so, you very much for having me. Again, I'm not trying to keep anybody here longer. I guess I thought that was going to go a little longer than I uh, thought. But I will just, in closing, just want to summarize from my own brain here. You're all going to move forward <clears throat> with adding voices, ex officio positions to the some of the committees that we just mentioned. Yes. Um, as it relates to uh, a formal positions on the board, you are all saying that's will be left up to all of us, dare I say, call it neutral position. Okay, okay. Great. Drake, do you want to add anything? No, the only thing I would say that the chancellor mentioned is that uh, we do think it's really important to have those four legislators. Those four legislators. That would be uh, the takeaway. And, and that the 
rest are really policy decisions right. that I've made. Just in case you cross paths with Mark as you're leaving, I was to say. One never knows. Hey, you <laughs> can't be so funny. Give your heads up. <laughs> you don't need to show up next week. Yes, no more bullets. Yeah. So I, I always believe that it takes you a year to figure out what your job is. We certainly need to figure out how to do it. <laughs> and then I hear it. So, do you have a get well date for Vermont State Universities in mind? Get well date? Mm -hmm. Data is probably going to be, we're going to have a lot of students coming through the front door and we'll be able to keep all the positions viable that we have right now with the and staff. I don't know that I have a date. I hadn't been thinking about that, though. Um, I, I certainly, uh, you know, through all of the challenges that I have seen, I I see an awful lot of opportunities. I, I see a variety of paths that I think that we can take on. I'd like to, you know, in the spirit of what I've just said, I'd like to really talk more to faculty, staff, and students to see uh, what are some of the uh, pieces that they are very, you know, interested in doing. But I, I think what excites me the most is that there are a lot of avenues, and I suspect that we will take most of those avenues to get back to a, a, a healthier uh, position. But without the support of this legislature, none of this would be possible. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I think when I first came to your committee, uh, our students are 50% um, hell eligible. They are 50% the first person in their family to go to college. And what that means is that we do need legislative support and we need an appropriation to ensure that those students can stay in college. And so that would be very important. And so thank you all for all that you've done. Will you come back and talk to us before the end of the session? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Great. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thanks so much. Nice to see Appreciate you. it. Thanks, Drake. <clears throat> Looks like our next guest has arrived. Why don't you join us at the table? And that's right. We'll get right back. Oh. That's the idea. idea. That's the idea. The sun's shining. You know, it felt a little bad that I'm holding you up from a oh, uh, long weekend. She's going to be here by the start. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Before we move forward, any questions or comments or anything you want me to note as it relates to uh, the Chancellor's testimony, the bills we have around the state? Colleges and universities. Anybody else you'd want to hear from or people? Sounds like a policy question. Yes. <laughs> Which... I mean, I've asked you this before. I can ask everyone. I don't yeah. understand the issue with having legislative trustees on, on these four. I just don't understand what the problem is. There's oh, having... <clears throat> some conflict with having legislative trustees on our higher education boards, and I just don't. If someone could yeah, help yeah, me help articulate that, yeah. yeah. Just... So I'm not sure what, I don't remember if Senator Westman articulated why he wanted to remove. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can say historically, some have felt as though um, those spots perhaps, and I'm not 100% sure on this, could be better used by people who might have philanthropic capabilities, might have abilities to go right out, different kinds of talents, give the authority to this to the board itself, let itself perpetuate in a way. Um, <clears throat> there's always been, I'd say, Senator, if you would, uh, I would, I would characterize it in the Senate, Oh, it's a minority position, right? it's not party-wise in any way, but that has had some folks over the years. Okay. Do, do, you think, do, do, do folks think there might be a conflict of interest? Or? I, don't, I don't think, well, yes, good question. I do remember some people saying, well, the legislature is responsible for appropriating, but I'm not really sure I would fall into that category of conflict of interest. In some ways, I think it's been helpful to be able to call on legislators who are in the building to come down to talk to us about certain issues sometimes. <clears throat> but I also understand where a board might want to self-perpetuate and get, you know, different talent for different reasons and sort of create their own 
flow, um, workflow and sort of talent pool. But again, I would I and I don't hope I'm not mischaracterizing anybody else's thoughts, but I'd say that's kind of maybe a question for a few people. Right. And it doesn't seem like the boards are suggesting changes. No, yeah. I don't think we've ever heard from someone maybe tough to do to come in and say we'd like these. But to your point, well taken, we have it, even um yeah. So uh, <clears throat> so just from a personal perspective, my my understanding of the initiative was not so much to remove legislators, but to include staff, faculty, students, so that there's a more balance, more insight into the actual, to, to the chancellor's point, day-to-day -day kind of, you know, what's really happening on the campus. And I'll leave it at that. That's, that's yeah, and I was yeah. my question wasn't specific to this bill. I've just been hearing like they're in the in the air. In either, yeah, yeah, in the, yeah. That there are some legislators who are like, oh yeah, I don't think there should be trustees. Right. You know, so I was curious. And I think Senator Westman is in his bill takes two legislators off, right. which again, I don't think that would pass the Senate floor. Okay. I don't think. I think there are still people that I say it's the minority that feel as though, okay, don't want legislators there. But I think overall people see it as a good thing. And um, so I think the question before us that everyone will have to decide is, as the chancellor is moving forward with putting back with staff and students on committees as not voting, great, that's a great step, but do people want people as voting members on the board and that I need to all of you to decide whether or not you want us to move forward with that piece of the bill. And then the other pieces of the bill we've discussed a little bit, which is Chancellor altogether. Well, S216 has it's, the same component. Exactly. Uh, so we could think 238. Exactly. So, so we one, could, you know, one is just a you know Collinmore's bill, and the other one is Richie Westman, yeah. and he's the yeah. He's on the appropriation committee. So fair enough. And I'm fine with however we might want to move this piece of those bills, putting it on either bill. Uh, I prefer not to give comp more credit for anything, <laughs> but that's just a guiding principle I have for Casey's watching. Yeah, okay. <laughs> comp yeah. great. However, you guys yeah. want to do it. Yeah, yeah. So any thoughts on that? People still people want to do it. Do people want to move in that direction? Of reducing the number. What's that? Of reducing the number of legislators. No, of adding a faculty and staff right. member yeah. to yes. the board for that. And I can put it on the, the agenda for next week just as a conversation, but it's something we've got to kind of move on or not. Yeah. Yeah, just to find balance, I'd love to hear from the board chair. So for a yeah. member of the board, just to kind of okay. get their perspective. That's fair. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have, uh, I believe the chair of the board is still Lynn Dickinson. Um, so I'll ask Morgan to ask Lynn Dickinson to come down next Monday, Tuesday for 20 minutes. Can we also get the chairman of the board, uh, uh, education board, state education board, to come talk to us? Jen Jennifer uh, Sanderson? Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, because I got some different perspective going on. Um, what she does oh, and it relates to Senator Kulik's bill right. around this. Yeah, right. we can ask her to come in again. I do remember we asked her once the board said, hey, we'd like you guys to handle that, but you can always try again and see okay. if they want to win. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Christopher Kaufman, Executive Director of the Vermont Humanities Council. You came in last year, I believe, also, and maybe said, how do you do to all of us? I, I did, very briefly. Great. Yeah. And you wanted to weigh in on S220, the library bill. I do. Great. So please, yeah. the floor is yours. All right. Uh, before I get started on that, I, I have to kind of comment on what I do. Uh -huh. uh, yes. So you probably have seen this already. If you want more to take home for your uh, constituents on town meeting week, town meeting today, uh, this, I believe the pages are coordinated with the Secretary of State, who is our mm -hmm. partner. Producing this book. I always love free comic books. So. Free comic books, the free comic book day uh, is coming up. And this has been presented, this is created by uh, Vermont Humanities Council? This is a, a collaboration with Vermont Humanities, the Center for Cartoon Studies, and the Secretary of State. And how long has this been out? 
about a year and a half. Terrific. Um, we went through 20,000 faster than you could blink. We have ordered another 20,000 so of the second edition. So those are now ready to go for talking things. Uh, okay. This is also our spring season of public talks. So, uh, so now I'll talk about S220. Uh, so I, again, my name is Christopher Coppin Ilstra. I've been the executive director at Vermont Humanities for about six years now, so I probably can't claim that I'm new. Um, and this year marks our 50th anniversary as an organization. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities and based in Washington, D.C., and the Library of Congress. Um, also serving as the Vermont Center for the Book. We're a very close partner with the uh, Vermont State Department of Libraries. Um, I personally was a proud member of the Legislative Working Group on the Status of Libraries in Vermont. Uh, and I believe I may be the only member of the Working Group who is neither a librarian nor a trustee, a library trustee. Uh, but I do have 30 years of experience as a community organizer in the cultural space. Uh, and. Uh, hope that I brought some, some level of expertise to the table. Uh, we work for and with libraries and librarians every day in every county um, and in every season. Uh, we run lifelong learning programs across the state. We do summer humanities camps with public libraries and schools for teenagers and tweens. Uh, we run professional development programs and early literacy for early educators. Uh, and with support from the Vermont Department of Libraries, we are uh, the coordinators for the Vermont Early Literacy Initiative, which provides convening technical assistance and mentoring support uh, to libraries and communities across Vermont, generally speaking, uh, lower income communities uh, and their libraries. Uh, we also, with the Vermont Department of Libraries, run, run a series of young adult author residencies um, that is uh, coordinated with the Vermont School Library Association. Uh, last week's Farmer's Night with Keckle and Moon was part of one of those young adult residencies. Keckle also visited Main Street Middle School, Montpelier High School, and Spalding High School. Uh, really glad to be here today to speak in support of S220, uh, what I call the Omnibus Library Bill. I don't know what you call it. Uh, thankful for Senator Hardy for introducing that. Uh, it contains many of the recommendations of the working group. Um, and we're grateful to you all for your due diligence and your support of many of the working group's recommendations. Um, I'm totally aware that it's Friday afternoon, so I don't have a lot to say, but I will be happy to answer as many questions as I can if you'd like. But this is overall you're supporting the bill. Overall, and we're the, very much in support of the bill. Takeaway. Yeah. Uh, that should be the takeaway. Uh, and I just wanted to note a couple of places where I know you have concerns. Um, and uh, say our perspective on those concerns. I, you know, first of all, the ebook section uh, recommendations. We know you have some concerns about um, whether that um, would actually cause more problems than it solves. We've removed that section, um, and I know you've yeah. removed it for now. Um, and I would just like to say that, as a matter of equity um, and access, uh, I think it's very important that that the legislature continue to think about that issue uh, over time. And now might not be the right time to be putting that in this legislation, but it's not gonna go away. Uh, and particularly in relation to those issues of equity and access, I think about people who are reliant on eBooks or audiobooks um, in order to be able to read and to access materials. And I think, and we'll take a little more testimony on this, but we did, as I recall, are running up against federal copyright laws on this issue. So, yeah. but I appreciate it. It will be an ongoing conversation. It's complicated, the intersections of capitalism and, uh, uh, and access. Uh, moving on, I'm really delighted that you're supportive of providing more guidance to public municipal and school libraries on collection development and retention policies. This was a really critical piece of the working group report for me. Um, to provide uh, consistent model policies and requirements around <clears throat> collection development uh, is going to be so important in the coming years, especially as we see what's been happening in other states uh, around book bans, book challenges, uh, migrating um, towards Vermont. Um, as we've seen, libraries and often very specific librarians have come under undeserved fire uh, for curating a collection of books represents and serves the needs of the entire community. 
uh, the language in the bill as it stands now would really help to clarify um, what a good collections policy is um, and what a reasonable book challenge is. And I think that's very, very important uh, that our largely part-time librarians and certainly volunteer trustees have the option to get really good information on what a collection development policy should look like and what a book challenge policy should look like. So thank you for your support on that. Um, moving on to the next part, uh, we are strongly supportive of lowering the patron confidentiality age in public libraries to 12 years old. Um, in alignment with the age that minor children can make medical decisions, autonomously, especially related to mental health, drug abuse, and alcohol abuse treatment. Um, we know you've heard this from other advocates, but I just want to say it again. I think this is critical. Um, we know from our work at Vermont Humanities with middle and high school students that their public and school libraries are uh, vital, important sources of accurate information, accurate being key. Um, on a wide variety of topics that young people are concerned about, but they may not yet feel comfortable or ready to talk about with their adult caretakers or authority figures. Lowering that age of patron confidentiality assures young people that the library will be a safe environment for research and learning on difficult topics. It steers them towards reliable, again, accurate information sources rather than Google or YouTube or heaven forbid, TikTok, right? We can assure you that if younger patrons can't safely and confidentially access library resources, they will seek the information they want elsewhere, and that information that they find may not be good. Uh, so this uh, piece of the bill to lower that confidentiality age to 12 is really important to us. I can speak from my personal experience growing up in Virgins in the 1970s and 80s, that the Bixby Library was an extraordinarily important resource for me to look for information that I could not ask my parents about. Regarding the appropriations in the bill, I know that the state librarian said yesterday that she supports the governor's recommendation, and I will not uh, gainsay her position on that, but I will say from Vermont Humanities' perspective, certainly from the perspective of the working group, that we asked uh, for an appropriation for two additional staff people in the department and one additional staff person at the Agency of Education for very good reasons. Um, they, we had a full day of discussion on staffing in libraries around Vermont, including uh, the State Library. Um, and we learned, of course, that the State Library has been shrinking for years and years and years uh, and is much smaller than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, restoring two additional outreach positions would actually make it possible uh, for the department to do the work that we're asking them to do in other parts of the bill, rather than simply piling that onto a small and overburdened staff. Uh, it's not no money, I know that. I know you're trying to make very difficult decisions, uh, but it's not a lot of money to support two additional positions there and the one at AOE. Um, we did hear from school librarians that they are flying out to have that AOE position back. Uh, I'm sure that many of you know that school librarians are often quite part-time, um, and they often are splitting their position among several different libraries. So to have an AOE consultant position to help them um, would really add a lot of value for a relatively low cost. Uh, so that's, that's really important to us. Uh, the last thing that I, I really want to address is this issue of the criminal threatening penalties. And my organization, and, and I don't have a particular position on whether or not enhanced penalties for criminal threatening is the right solution. Um, that is what's in the working group report, and it was thoughtfully uh, put in there. Uh, there may be other approaches that work just as well for helping libraries to become safer places. I do want to say that the testimony that we heard in the working group about public safety was really disturbing. Uh, that we heard story after story from big libraries and small libraries about the impact of the ongoing, especially the opioid crisis on their operations. 
uh, as well as people with general mental health crises coming into the warm, safe, public, open space, uh, and then having difficulties that create security safety issues um, for the staff and for other patrons. I think it's honestly only a matter of time before somebody gets hurt uh, if we don't do something. Um, so whether or not enhanced penalties for criminal threatening is the right thing, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think you can ignore that our public spaces are really struggling with safety right now. One of the other pieces that we heard over and over again, which was frankly a little bit devastating, uh, was from librarians who said, I've got somebody in my building who's having a mental health crisis and I can't get the police to come and help us. We are not trained to do this. Uh, we do not know how to keep our staff and our patrons safe and the police won't help. So it's a bigger system-wide thing, right? This is not something that's just specific to the libraries, uh, but it is something that's really key. Last week, uh, I think maybe some of you know that the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities was here from Washington. She was in this building for a day. Uh, I also took her to several libraries around the state. Uh, and one of the librarians told us that they had been attempting to provide harm reduction uh, services in the library, uh, including having sharps boxes in the bathrooms and things like that. Uh, and they had recently found that their sharps containers had been broken into uh, by people who were looking to reuse meals. Uh, right? We have to do something about this. Uh, it was, it was uh, hard to hear that story. Uh, I'm going to close here. It was really, truly an honor to participate in the working group. Uh, I, it was a lot of work um, over many, many months. Um, sometimes we, I think we felt like it would never end. Um, but I, I personally really grew in my understanding of the challenges and the opportunities facing Vermont libraries. And I can't tell you how appreciative I am of Senator Hardy and all of you for taking that report seriously, uh, for crafting not just this legislation, but several pieces of legislation uh, and moving it forward. Um, it really gives me a lot of faith in all of you um, that that you care about the work that we did. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Should you you on that one? No, no, okay. no. There were no actual legislators working through. Is that right? That's fair. Yeah. 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 Right. Any questions? First, I really like your uh, sticker. Shakespeare. Yeah, it's really great. Humanities. I want one. I really want one. Um, the below. <laughs> oh my gosh, I guess I have to go to it. Um, I just wanted to say that I didn't really understand the importance of the AOE liaison because I happened to work in a school that was really well staffed and had a had a had a hearty, healthy budget. Um, but I have I've since learned that that's not the case around the state. And we have a lot of schools that are rural that have one librarian or a part-time librarian. And those folks often feel very isolated and alone. And my experience in the library, you know, we're talking a lot about mental health issues with kids. And I mean, I get a little bit emotional when I talk about this because it's so important. And one of the things that keeps coming up here and I've read the Surgeon General's report on loneliness and isolation is that, you know, kids and, and people need to be in spaces where they can get together and they can gather and they can connect with each other. And I think that school libraries are one of those places. And when I was a librarian back in the old days, um, I worked really hard to create a space that was welcoming to all kids, that was like a safe space um that was a creative space why I, I i need this i turned this old newspaper um storage closet into a maker space and kids would go in there and do art and do science and um so if we're gonna put our money where our mouth is if we're gonna really uh do what we claim we want to do which is meet the needs of kids in terms of mental health creates spaces that are safe for them and welcoming, then I think 
this position is really important. And I, I've, come, I've done like a 180 degree turnaround because the more I, I understand how all of Vermont works, not just my little bubble in Chittenden County, the more I, I think this is a really crucial position. So I just wanted to thank you for your work with the group and for putting that particular provision in there. I, I hope we can find a way to, to make it happen. And especially, I was thinking, especially if somehow that position could also speak a little bit to all the literacy work that we're doing, you know, that would be fantastic. Because I mean, reading and literacy, you know, go together. Um, and libraries play a part in all of that. So anyway, thank you. And that was a long commentary, um, but I appreciate you listening. First, Sarah, a question. Yes. Uh, so you, I, I received an email yesterday from the constituent asking a question about uh, library uh, positions in the bill specifically. And um, and I'm going to revert back to your comment that libraries have changed over the past 10 years, certainly over the last 20 years. Isn't, and this may not be a fair question for you specifically, but since we have the, the chief of librarians, commissioner of librarians, <laughs> I, I will so, happily throw it over to her. <laughs> isn't there a possibility if, if, if libraries, if library usage is contracting even a bit, isn't there an opportunity to redistribute somewhere the, the manpower to, to you know, for those positions that are being? The library usage has actually expanded quite a bit. So, yes. Then, if you can revert back to your comment about how libraries have changed over the past ten years, that would be helpful. Because sure, libraries are doing a lot of different things now, right? When when I was young, perhaps libraries were places where you went to get printed books, and you still do that, right? You go and get printed books, um, but you also go there for lots of other reasons, right? A lot of people go to the library for access to the internet, but don't have internet at home. Um, so librarians are serving as, as job counselors and resume writers and helping people to get unemployment benefits, for example. That's you know, it's just some of the top uses that are happening in libraries right now. Uh, you can just walk down the street to Kellogg Hubbard and you can see that the number of kids accessing that library after school is enormous. Uh, and libraries are, in many cases, serving as <laughs> uncompensated childcare. Uh, facilities for parents who don't have the resources to pay for after school programs, right? Almost everything that happens in the library is free, including all of our programs. So there, there are many ways that libraries are, are expanding. Uh, I would say usage is not going down. If anything, it's becoming more and more important, especially in our smaller communities where a library might be literally the only public space available in the community. Safe space. Yeah. And the only warm space in the winter, right, for people who might be struggling with shelter. Um, so that's really critical as well. If you want to add anything to that. If I could add, um, after Adele now, I'm the state librarian and the commissioner of the department, the, the work that's going on is shifting in libraries and um, I just, I'm not asking for additional FTEs. You know, this is an area where the, the legislation, the bill has FTEs for the department. But when I hear the question, I become concerned that there's an idea out there someplace in your constituent's mind, even if not in yours, that the department should shrink further. And I have to speak to you about that because we have 18 staff right now. And actually our work is expanding. We have now got a grant program for building projects, and we, we're paying for those consultants, uh, and those, not, they're not consultants, but those professionals to run that program, state employees, limited service. So we are actually now up to 20 because the need is so great for support. Our Department of Libraries provides centralized services to people around the whole state of Vermont. When you request a book and it gets to your library through interlibrary loan, we did that. That's our courier system. We have a statewide contract. When you log on to the Vermont Online Library, that's my team. We got that. And that's when you talk to the state colleges about their databases, any of those databases, we got those. Those are our Vermont Online Library. We use the, the appropriation from the general fund and our IMLS money. We grant federal funds that make up about a third of our budget. Our staff, we need staff to do that work. And 18 staff is many, many fewer staff than the department had. 
And I know the report is very long, so I can point you to the chapter on structures and organizations. Our research showed that the department used to have 68 people. They were distributed around the state in multiple buildings. We're all now centralized. There are 18 of us. Please do not cut us further. There is, there, we are working to the tilt. I will, to the hilt. I would love to show you my calendar. It's crazy. There's, we're doing so much work and we're all functioning really, really well and at high volume. So please do not, do not take anyone who, who says something else very seriously without a further conversation, which I'd be happy to tour you all around and show you what we do and who does it. I would add as a uh, partner, uh, Senator Gus Mastropoulos. No, I just wanted to say it's it's better for constituents to hear it from you than to hear it from us. Yeah. With our filters and our, you know, various various, various degrees of sensitivity and you know knowledge background. Well, and just one more piece. You know, a lot of what's happening now, people point to well, things are online. Um, to maintain the statewide online resources requires staffing behind the scenes. So our online databases, our ebooks and the audiobooks, we're actually building a platform for all Vermonters called the Palace app. So for every Vermonter to have a baseline of collections that no matter what their local library can afford, we get everybody these resources. That's the type of work that we do. Um, granting out federal funds for summer reading, for participation in the courier, we need some staff to kind of get everything working well with resource sharing. And that's that's the real function of our department at this point. We don't typically provide in-person service, although I might be doing story time on the library advocacy day here at the State House, which I'm very excited about. So if you know children, bring them to story time with the state librarian. But we don't typically do that kind of service. So all 16 year employees are state employees? Um, all 18 of our employees 18? are state employees. Yeah. How about the municipal libraries? Not None of the municipal right. libraries so, report to us. That, so there's an inequity in, in pay in a lot of cases with those. Because I'm hearing the same thing from my municipal library. She's got two part time employees that don't even qualify for the municipal uh, insurance program. And that is, that is a big issue that I don't know that it can be addressed statewide legislation because right there are municipal libraries and their private nonprofit libraries and they all run slightly differently and issues of equity among the 183 libraries is really important mm -hmm. um, and pay is certainly something that we've heard a lot about as well as health insurance mm -hmm. right that most library staff don't work enough hours mm -hmm. to get health insurance any final questions or comments for mr Cook? Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you for your work. Thank very much appreciated. So we are just waiting for Ledge Council to come down to finish our work for the week. And so why don't you take five minutes? Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, Friday, February 16th, 2.43. Two last sections on the library bill, <clears throat> sections uh, 15, 16, and 17. So three sections. Uh, Returning to the back side, page two of the um, outline that Mr. Anderson has provided us with. And then, as we've talked about, we just, there are some things that are settled, but there are a number of things that aren't settled. And we have people coming in next week to talk to us about everything from firearms to uh, questions about uh, municipal authority, et cetera. So it's all yours. Great. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. We're going to start in section 15. And for purposes of the outline, I grouped 15 and 16 together and as authority of the Department of Libraries. The first piece in section 15 would amend the duties and functions of the Department of Libraries to add a mandatory duty for the department to adopt a collection development policy that reflects diversity of race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, and Vermont's diverse people and history. So this is mandate to adopt election development policy. Um, so, Basically, those classes of people take that into consideration 
when advancing, adding to collections, etc. Yes. Sounds okay to make it. It's like it's kind of I'm still trying to find it. I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Uh, second page. Yes. Okay. Uh, section 15. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Were you at section one? Uh, no. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. No, we, yeah, this is good. This is good, good stuff, I would say. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to section six uh, to preface the discussion of this section, the report from the working group. Uh, suggested that the department should go back to its rules governing minimum standards for public libraries and up. That would not have required anything to be in statute if that authority had existed in the first place. And when I looked into it and pulled up the rules that were adopted, readopted in the 80s after being initially adopted, Yes, five years earlier than that, perhaps. Um, there was not a delegation of authority for those rules to be adopted, but they were approved by LCAR. So wanting to make sure that the department could review them, yeah. revise them, and have them have some sort of force of law moving <laughs> forward, uh, this was put together to reflect what the working group had set out as areas to be covered by the exhaust. But from what I understand, perhaps it is not the desire of the department to actually adopt rules with the force of law at all. So this may be something that is unnecessary that they may be doing instead through policy or something else that would be non-binding and unenforced. Based on there. Uh, thank you. Catherine Donnell, State Librarian. Um, the, the working group did wish for the department to update the minimum standards. So I do want to be sure, if, as as council just said, that that is the case. Uh, when I look at the section here, um, my it, it's not that the department refuses to go through the process, but I think that saying may rather than shall and giving us a purview that's a little bit less specific might be more helpful. And there are some aspects of what is enumerated here that even the senators in your own committee would probably be reluctant to take on, such as setting the amounts of money that municipalities should right. pay through a rulemaking process. Right. So I would request perhaps that uh, this be broadened, that the department have the ability to engage in rulemaking to update the minimum standards, but that those be written in a, that this be written a little bit more broadly so that it's in matters related to public libraries. Uh, there are some aspects of this um, rulemaking portion, including requiring collection development policies. Well, if, the, if S220 goes through, that's already required by law. So us including that in rulemaking wouldn't make very much sense, for example. Um, but I also do wonder if, there is anything necessary for us to just continue making recommendations. Every single aspect of the prior iteration of rules is recommended. The department didn't actually require anything in the, in the earlier rulemaking. And if all we're doing is making recommendations and guidelines, I don't think we need this part of the bill. So it's really, I think, a policy decision for you all. Would you like us to be setting standards that then municipalities have to try to meet? Would you like us to, um, and, and if we do that, are there specific things you really do want us to determine? And then I would look at each of these very carefully, and I would probably beg you to take out the part where my department is responsible for telling municipalities what the per capita amount of money they ought to spend. With me. Is that D minimum municipal funding for public libraries? Yes, that seems like it would be possibly better placed in the legislature than in the department. But I would defer to you all on that distinction. I like the idea of both change of shall to may because I'm hearing 
you know, people are get tired of state mandating what they do. You know, because they're because they are local. You know, it's it's all if you recommend it and it works for them, then you then they adopt it, then that's good. We can all agree, but the mandate something doesn't doesn't set well, particularly with the climate out there right now. Not real happy with us. So their taxes going down to If I please say one additional. Yes, please, um, please, please. I do want to say that the reason that the working group made this recommendation is that many libraries in the state of Vermont do not meet the 1986 standards today. The standards include things like that they need a collection development policy and a reconsideration policy. That's why we suggested you put that in actual law rather than leaving it in these um, minimum standards that have no teeth. So, um, you know, I, I would say if you would like the department to have the ability to, with some discretion and with some conversation, go forward and begin the rulemaking policy uh, the rulemaking process on certain topics, then I would I would say maybe delineate exactly which of those you'd like us to provide rulemaking guidance on. But just this A, B, C, D. Yeah. Or you could leave it broad and, and trust the department. I think that you, I hope you can see that we have a good group of staff who are in close connection with the library community and that we could, um, that we would be judicious in that we're within the agency of administration. And I don't think any agency of administration would want us to start dictating every little rule at the local level. Yeah, please go. So would Senator Williams's um, suggestion of just using the word may instead of shall, would that cover it for you? We leave all the, the A, B, C, D, but we put a may in? I think and that's made the proper legal that we would use. So to be clear, that would be granting the department the discretion as to whether or not to adopt rules, period, right? And then this enumerated list um, is going to be the scope of the delegation of your legislative authority to the department, right? The rulemaking process is actually a legislative process and it can't take place unless the General Assembly says what may be legislated and what the channels of that legislation seem to be. You define what the power is by describing it here, right? So changing the shell to a man makes it discretionary. It relieves the department of the duty to cover each one of these spaces. Mm -hmm. It gives them discretion as to what rules may be adopted. Um, you would likely have to put some sort of description of what the rules would cover. Um, but that is one road to take. I will know that if there's no intent for this to have the outward force of law, if there is not going to be a mandate in the rules for the public libraries, then it may be even better just to clarify that the department has discretion to adopt procedures under the Administrative Procedures Act. And then that would essentially be guidance and recommendations <clears throat> governing the Department of Libraries own process and essentially encouraging the public libraries to meet the standards. Ms. Delnay, yeah, Ms. Delnay I, tell me again why you really don't think it should be shall. I mean, this seems to me. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Let me let me try to explain. There are just forward. Yeah, there are two shalls in the sentence. Right. And one of the shalls, I I think that the department is very open to engaging in rulemaking. In rulemaking. Okay. If rulemaking is actual rulemaking. Yes. If rulemaking is only going to be guidance, then rulemaking the the procedure of rulemaking I is understand. quite onerous. Yeah. And as far as the items on the list, to answer Senator Felix's question, the department is not in favor of establishing continuing education requirements for public library trustees, per my earlier testimony. That was not a working group recommendation. I would not want to see that be something that we must do. Um, we also are not the right people to be in charge of, the right experts to be in charge of the regular inspection of library buildings and property. Um, these are places of public accommodation. They're already inspected. They should be inspected already by the towns. 
And then under 5D, the minimum municipal funding for public libraries. Those are the types of things that we would recommend, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't actually, cool. and we, we have no enforcement mechanism for any rulemaking. And so I, I just want to be sure that we that you all have this conversation and that you know what it is that you're asking us, okay. that you're directing us to create rules around. Because remember, one and two have already been taken care of in an earlier section of the bill. Mm -hmm. Now we're down to minimum standards for the public availability of information technology at public libraries. We did a survey, it's included in the working group report. They're all providing this except maybe five yeah. libraries. And almost every library also has Wi-Fi all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, my question is, how Your much- is just really needed, really. That, Any of it really needed. Thank you for saying it succinctly, okay. yes. So based on what you just said, that one, two, and three are already taken care of, and then section five, B and D, aren't if you're interested, you know, you're not even interested in, in pursuing that. Um, well, they're important. Or they're, they're important, but they're being done elsewhere. Regular inspection. We've had that conversation about minimum, minimum municipal funding for public libraries. That really leaves whether or not you should establish recommendations for libraries, building specification, meeting room. Yeah, it just seems like maybe we yank this whole section. Or if there's some, I mean, I, perhaps council can suggest a different way to phrase it so that we have the authority to develop statewide guidelines or the other the other entities that we can. But my what sense do you is, want to do in terms of statewide guidelines? We'd like we'd like to kind of show where what the what a good baseline might be for per capita spending, but okay. not require per capita spending. Uh -huh. We'd like to have baselines for programming for libraries of different sizes, but not take away somebody's tax exempt status if they can't provide that, have a baseline for hours. A lot of this is really just a recommendation. It's not a, since there's no state You could do that funding, tomorrow, right? I, I believe we could. Without us doing anything. I think we could. Now, Senator Williams loves to put things in law and mandate They're all things. Well, I think that would be our score. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> call on me is, uh, who do you really work for? Are you under the Agency of Education? No, no. I... So, I, so what authority do we have to to tell her what, what she's going to have to do? Oh. Well, <laughs> you'll be happy to know we have a lot of authority. Okay. And yeah, so we can, but well, to your point, and I think there's a lot of it she can do right now right. on her own. So I'm a philosopher. Mandating. And Senator, and, yeah. And from what I hear from my library, yeah. librarian, she wants, she likes the guidance that she gets from the state right there. Okay, so, that's good to hear. But my select board, yeah. they now like it because. She comes back to the select board and says, hey, right. you got a you got a responsibility to be doing this and you're not funding me, so I yeah. can do it. Right. Right. So there definitely seems to be some conversations and tensions there. Some maybe somewhere in between yeah. making a, a mandate and making a guidance for right. sure. Senator Julie? I was just going to suggest yeah. if you're okay with your blessing that maybe the two of you could come up with with council and um, Ms. Delnair come up with some language, if you even want language in this section that we could use. I mean, it doesn't, in some ways it doesn't hurt to have rulemaking authority over certain things. Mm -hmm. If we need it, then we could do it. But at the same time, what exactly that, and what we would direct these entities that don't respond to us, that aren't responsible to us, that there's no direct line of authority, sure. that's a little bit trickier. Other states do, when they give state aid, have requirements to receive state aid. We don't give state aid. And so then these requirements upon them, right. while they serve as a standard to me, and that is very helpful, there's no, there's no carrot, there's no stick, there's a lot of extra work. What if we were building up with Senator Dulux at take this section out and then if there's a need you find during our conversations over the next week with this you need something included around anything related to this you work with ledge council on it we'll 
pending. Okay. I mean, I do want to go on the record saying we plan to update guidelines, Terrific. but I think we can do that already. And that's what we thought we were doing. We didn't realize we needed this authority. Okay. I, uh, yeah, go for I it. just, uh, I don't think, I, I don't mean to speak for the committee, but I don't believe we have like real strong, um, a real strong sense of what we want to mandate you to do. I think the purpose of this bill was to take the report and sort of try to put into action the, the recommendations in the report. So yeah. if that if this recommendation isn't germane or to the to the report, then yeah, yeah, yeah. The only said. the only question I would have, and and I'll talk later with you, um, is is there any utility to putting into the chapter on you know chapter twenty two? that we have the authority to set guidelines on these topics is that would probably be helpful in some ways, because then if a town says, well, who says they, the, the municipal library and librarian and the trustees say, well, it says right here in statute that the department may set these standards. And that might actually I think not be right. It might be something we can put in, but it might have to wait until next year, actually, also depending on on what uh, folks think. So you two will work on this or not work on this at some point, or maybe not. But for now, we'll get rid of section 16. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Section 17, the appropriations, the appropriations, $500,000 to the Department of Libraries, and it was uh, 112500 to the Agency of Education. That level of funding primarily relates to the positions, so okay. that will change depending on what you want to do with that section. So the five hundred thousand to the Department of Libraries for programs and services, that there are no positions connected with that amount. That is actually going to be two hundred and seventy-five thousand. Yes, and there's no positions connected with that. Okay. That was figure put. Yeah, bill was introduced to support all of the different asks and duties here for the department. Okay, and we can still do that, right? I mean, we can still rack and hold that. Yeah. Yeah. Does that number change at all given that we have pulled some of sections of the bill, like the copyright? Yeah, like okay. Yeah. If pulling out a lot of those pieces, you may want to get some updated estimates from with your fiscal officers. Yeah, it, it actually would be very helpful to understand what that does represent of what's left in the bill. Yeah. Otherwise. No rationalization. With those changes, would you mind coming back next week with a new version? Yes. And if you would, if you're not comfortable doing so, I'm happy to do so. But if you are comfortable copying Julia Richter on it and saying, here's a new version, going to see Senate Ed, would you be willing to update the fiscal code? I really enjoyed working with uh, Ms. Bernard's in the Joint Fiscal Office and especially with Julia. So, yes, I do that. And Morgan will find, I know we're getting packed, but maybe when would you have time to update this by Thursday? Oh, yes, absolutely beautiful. So, maybe we'll find up uh, to 30 minutes on Thursday. Um, great. All right, thank you. Thank you all. For having me again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you go off? Can you go off?